Hi, Mage fans. This is your host, Terry Robinson with Mage the Podcast. And before we get to our interview with professional RPG and fiction writer Ray Cole, I have some community notes. Discord user Kamak has written a love letter to Mage on their YouTube channel, and a link is in the show notes. This installment is simply about the love of the game, and it made me feel warm and fuzzy watching it. Those links are also available on our webpage. Additionally, Undead Foodstuffs is doing a YouTube series on their channel on players that become characters in a mage game. Again, the link is in the show notes. If you made a neat mage thing and would like us to pass it on, tell us at magethepodcast at gmail.com, at magethepodcast on Twitter, or drop us a line in our Discord, discord.me slash magethepodcast. And with that, on with the show. So how did you get into RPG gaming? Well, the long story involves like going back to high school and having friends who played uh, Changeling the Dreaming, which was super up my alley. But I sort of matured into, not matured, not like it was better. I just sort of ripened into <laughs> into someone who played a lot of Exalted. And that was sort of my gateway drug into now, you know, then it was D&D and then it was, have you heard of this Powered by the Apocalypse thing? And, and now I'm like all up in trying to, you know, back a bunch of Kickstarters for indie games and just getting all excited about it. Like I've always been like a writer and a storyteller. So role playing was really just the next step, I guess. I, I feel like for me, my relationship with things that arrive from the internet, everything fits into two buckets. Things that I ordered two days ago that arrive from Amazon or things that yeah. I ordered two years ago from <laughs> <laughs> from Kickstarter, where it's like- It was finally fulfilled. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and periodically, I've almost bought something that I forgot that I backed on Kickstarter. Lunar's Fangs at the Gate. Apparently, I participated in that. <laughs> like, oh, for, neat. Yeah. Didn't even, know, didn't even like, know of Exalted yet. I'm like, ah, Future Terry may one day be interested in this. I should probably back it. Fangs at the Gate is- really good oh that. yeah that's um i like the page eight <laughs> illustration where it appears that cover character is fighting link after link stole captain america's shield that's exalted exactly <laughs> <laughs> exactly <sighs> do you have a favorite game at current like where is your gaming heart right now if there's like oh, a single man. location this is weird right now my favorite game is a game that isn't out yet I'm I'm really into like everything that's been coming out about Monster Care Squad from Sandy Pug. What is that? Oh, oh my god. It's it's like a Ghibli or I guess it's Ghibli. I don't know who decided it was pronounced Ghibli. A Studio Ghibli inspired setting where instead of fighting these monsters, you basically play a specialized team of fantasy like veterinarians <gasps> and you come to these societies that are like this this epic monster was once protecting us or doing this for us or whatever, but now it's gotten sick and and we don't know what happened and and you play the game in stages of like showing up at the town or or wherever you're going and trying to diagnose what's wrong with the monster. Then the next phase is like creating your cures, which is like all your potions or, you know, researching spells. And then the third stage is actually encountering this maddened monster that may actually really want to hurt you, but your whole goal is to try to heal it. And the art is beautiful. And I've, I'm so impressed with Sandy Pug and, and Liam Ginty's world building, which we'll probably get into later. But I am I am so into this game and I don't even have my hands on it. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't really, doesn't really exist yet. Are, are you in the phase where like a small child sees a commercial for a thing and it's the most interesting thing in the world and they want to talk about it with everyone even though they know nothing about it? I, I have those. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> as soon as I backed it, I was like, baby, and turned to my husband and tried to explain to him. <laughs> the game and then i had to back up and be like let me tell you about sandy pug and then i had to back up and be like let me actually tell you about liam ginty and then i had to back up like oh they were on our podcast let me tell you about that podcast episode so it was a it was a real adhd mess <laughs> i love inversions of oh that you're it's a fantasy setting and there's big monsters and you have to fight them i love inversions of like like you know the class like what is now the classic like undertale setting of mm -hmm. You can fight them if you want to, but why don't you befriend them? Why don't you try to help them? Well, I look forward to burning some money for this for game that I will likely never play, but sounds fascinating anyway. So, <laughs> so yeah. Congratulations, Sandy Puggos. You like their 15% referral fee. Chances are they'll have a backer kit, and that will be in the show notes, or it'll be on yes. like Amazon or something like that. Uh, so you are also a writer, so you're not just a, a super oh, yes. fan. What lines are you currently working on? I have already, I have work in the uh, Scion line. I wrote the Scion Jumpstart adventure, A Light Extinguished, 
I also have work that will be appearing in Scion Titanomachy, Scion Dragon. I have work appearing in Vampire 5th Edition. I'm, I'm in uh, Cults of the Blood Gods. I also have... <laughs> How much time do you have? <laughs> do you want me to give you my whole CV? <laughs> I've been really busy. Exalted Crucible of Legend. I'm doing a lot of work on Exalted Essence Edition, which I'm very, very excited about. Oh, I, I'm in uh, They Came From Beyond the Grave. <gasps> I wrote an adventure for They Came From Beyond the Grave. I'm in... <laughs> Trinity Continuum Assassins. I am working on some stuff for Green Ronin now. That's very exciting. Ooh. I got my hands on a lot of different pies. <laughs> and only one of them is available to be eaten. The rest, <laughs> I have no idea. This moves very slowly. So our notional topic is the idea of world building. And Mage is interesting in the old World of Darkness games because it has these very large, very established players. And if you kind of sweep them off the board, you wind up with a fundamentally different game in a lot of ways, where maybe with Vampire or with Werewolf, with Werewolf, you're always going to be fighting the things trying to destroy the world. With Vampire, you're always going to be dealing with dread, maybe with varying degrees of politics. But to me, for Mage, a lot of it really hinges around that that world built aspect of it. Uh, you have strong feelings about world building. Uh, why are you so passionate about world building in the process of doing so? I don't know if I could trace it to like a like an ignition point exactly, but I, I have always just really been into what ifs and and uh, especially genre writing. My before I started building my massive CV for RPGs, I was a um, well, I still am a fiction novelist. So a lot of my work comes down to really coming up with with interesting, thought provoking settings. And I feel like a good setting can be one of the most engaging and immersive parts of reading or playing in genre. It, it can be one of the one of the more engaging and immersive parts of playing in these games or reading these books. I find it really interesting. It's a really fun, it's a fun hobby, and now it's a fun profession. When you think of the process of developing a story, is world building versus plot a conversation that keeps going? Or do you kind of start with, with creating a world and then putting entities in the world and watching how it plays out? I guess kind of what is that a conversation back and forth between plot and world? Or does world building for you kind of come first or some other method? Well, with fiction, it really, they both inform each other and I'll be bouncing back and forth. Sometimes I start with a character concept and then think, okay, what sort of world needs to exist for them? Like what kind of a world would have created this character? And sometimes I come up with the world concept first and I think, okay, what would be a really interesting character to follow through the conflicts of this world? So, I mean, I know, I'm sorry, that's not really kind of a non-answer both, but honestly, they both form each other, inform each other and they become very intertwined. And I will often be bouncing back and forth between, wait, if I wanted this character to have a cool magic gun, what does that mean for the world that magic guns exist? <laughs> or, you know, back and forth. Oh, yeah. If you want to play something that's about royal palace intrigue, you have to have something that looks like a royal palace to have that intrigue exactly. in. Otherwise, it just fails. And that and right. that makes sense. And those world building choices kind of give you the array or panoply or creative space that your characters can exist in. How would you consider world building for an RPG to kind of be fundamentally different than for like a fictional work or a story or something? For fiction, ultimately, you are the player and the GM. Like, you'll have a, a different set of needs that arise out of trying to write fiction. Or, or for will building for games, your stories need to be more open ended because you need to create opportunities for players to pick the stories out themselves. In a novel, you kind of not always, but you, you kind of move from what's the character's goal and their motivation, what conflict are they facing, and then you resolve the whole thing. With a game, or you might bring up the goal, motivation, and conflict of here's what these players might want, here's what their motivations might be, and here's what those conflicts will be, but you can't answer how that conflict will be resolved because that's really up to the players. So world building for games tends to be, I guess, more freeing in that sense because it's not up to me to create the solutions for this, it's up to the players <laughs> to create the solutions. It can also be tricky because you need to take yourself out of your own, like, you need to take yourself out of your own head a little bit and think, okay, I might think this is cool. Is there room for someone else to kind of, you know, make a home in this concept and, de and develop it on their own? Or, or am I the only one who thinks this would be neat? <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. It it seems like it's one of those things where in a book, there's kind of an expectation that if a object or idea is brought up to a certain level of prominence by the author, we're going to get more information or that's going to factor into the story as a whole. Where an RPG can just have a book full of fascinating and interesting threads that m may never be touched 
buy a player at all. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's up to you to just sort of like throw all these breadcrumbs out and then the players get to decide what they want to engage with. So you wind up with this almost vastly more filled world for lack of a better term like one of the things i always ran into with rpgs is like there's threats around every corner or there's adventure around every corner because there needs to be to some extent um because you're not sure yeah what each person's going to pick up on when you're doing rpg world building do you have a process or is there a generally recognized best practice on how to build yourself a world one of the bits of advice i hear from a couple of different devs that is honestly the best bit of advice I've heard for world building when it comes to writing for games is anything that you write that will be player or GM facing, like basically it's going to go in the published product. It all has to be a hook for something. Otherwise you're, you're basically just wasting word count. If, if you're writing something that ultimately isn't a hook that your GMs or your players can engage with, why are you writing it? <laughs> why does it exist? Every sentence has to be a hook has been honestly one of the most useful things i heard when i started writing for games as opposed to writing for fiction as far as like recognized or recommended steps i don't know that there really is a one size fits all process for this there are people that will claim like oh i have this template just fill out this template i don't really trust that personally because mm-hmm. it's, it's such an individual process not just for the writer but for that writer's needs. Your world building is really an organic process and those steps will arise out of each individual's needs. Like I talked about before, there there may be different priorities for fiction as there are for games, but as you pointed out, these both require points of conflict. So beyond like needing hooks, you need to make sure that there's room for conflict in your world. Every It can't be, don't worry about it though, everything's fine, because then why are we here. Mm -hmm. Why are we playing this game? Mm -hmm. But you also want to, especially with games, once you've come up with kind of your big what if, you want to begin with the kind of stories and characters that you would encourage the players of this game to create. You may already start with a concept that's just like, oh, wouldn't it be cool to play in a world where vampires have to defend humanity from zombies, like the old webcomic Last Blood. And From there, you can start to kind of fractal out into, okay, what happened to this world that there are vampires and now a zombie apocalypse? How do the humans feel about vampires? How do the vampires treat the zombies? Like you can kind of spiral down into it. For super stripped down concepts, you may not even need much more than your goal, motivation, and conflict, like in in a general story. Uh, So it sounds like you've kind of laid down two directions. One, a, a storyteller may start with an idea of, there is a state of the world that I think is super interesting that I want to work backwards from and say uh, what could create that and what kind of interesting characters could exist in that world. Or you could kind of start from the character direction of these are some ideas I have for for interesting characters. What kind of world would allow that to exist? Is that a, a reasonable thing or have I collapsed the field of inquiry too much? I think that's that's a really good way to, to sum up like what most people's starting point are. From there is when it starts to get more complicated when you start looking into your world's possible geography and ecology, like maps, flora and fauna, relevant societies, including people's systems of faith. And then also thinking about their technologies like magic or black powder or AI or whatever. And again, you you will probably be bouncing around between these categories as needed because all three should inform each other. As soon as you decide, oh, this is a world where, you know, the land and water ratios are flipped. We have more land than we do water. That actually will now determine a little bit of your ecology and a little bit of the relevant societies and a little bit of the technology that they've developed. The idea still though, is to try to focus on the things your players will want to engage with or be forced to engage with as case may be. If you are developing, say an urban fantasy world, you probably don't need to spend too much time on what idyllic pastures there are because this is an urban fantasy setting and they probably won't spend a lot of time in the rolling farmlands (laughs) they'll probably be in your sprawling cityscape you will want to want to do your research you can i give you permission you can literally take ideas from real world or other sources you shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel but you also want to make sure you're not coming up with something and putting a really insensitive spin on it so do you do like multicultural worldwide research and also learn how to stop (laughs) <laughs> Learning how to stop world building is a skill that comes with time. A lot of people new to this will kind of over-engineer their world and end up getting bogged down in details over things that 
your players will not engage with that it just won't come up like like the whole idyllic pasture thing like this is an urban fantasy setting we don't need to know how farming economy works because we're going to be spending our time in big cities we can acknowledge that there are still farmers if they still exist in your world but we don't need to know all about what it's like to be you know growing soybeans right now (laughs) if if that makes sense there was a conversation i was listening to about the mechanics and blades in the dark where you have this faction system where you have all these uh, entities competing in a city and the storyteller or gm or whatever has the ability to say hey how are the relationships between different groups changing while my characters aren't looking and someone pointed Mm -hmm. out like that entire system is useless if the players are never going to see the effect of it like what's the point you've created a random number generator and work for yourself yeah uh, so um, we we are playing Made to the Ascension, which is a generally urban fantasy game. We have some main factions in the world. Now, when you say, let's talk about the technology, the beliefs, and the geography, it seems like we can, we can kind of zoom in. And in this case, the beliefs are going to be the worldviews of our major factions in the game. You have the Nefandi, who have this kind of demonic band or want to see the de- destruction of everything. You have the technocracy, which is going for either, in their opinion, to save the world with the soft embrace of stasis and boredom, or alternatively, to crush individuality. You have the traditions who aren't quite sure. They, they generally have a direction they want to go and aren't very good necessarily at moving that direction in the marauders which are all embracing chaos so if i'm as a storyteller and i want to tweak one of those settings and i say what if the marauders were not just crazy harbingers of of madness but characters that wanted to bring back the mythic age the era of high sorcery where, where merlin was around and they were knights and magic on the whole was easier to do because reality was more flexible i've made that initial setting tweak where i've said okay this core entity in the game, I am changing their belief. Do you have any recommendations on kind of how I should follow what the effects of that change would be? As far as effects within the setting, if you're going to make a a big change like that, I think that first consider what you're encouraging in your players by making that change. Back to the what sort of stories and characters do you think this would push your players toward? And then from there, look at the biggest events or factors of the setting as it was and then determine if those have been changed by what you're tweaking. There were other events that the Nefandi were involved in that would have probably played out differently now that they aren't like the super big bads and are just kind of misunderstood. Like look into that and see, okay, would this have changed any differently? And I guess from a meta standpoint too, you need to determine if this is something that your player characters will be aware of, like this is just how it's always been, or if this is like a new thing that they have to determine like, oh, wow, we've been getting them wrong this whole time. We've been taught the wrong things, et cetera. How do world building and tone interact? Oh, in big ways. Okay. (laughs) When you are building your world, building your setting, or morphing your previously established world into something else, um, you will end up focusing on uh, genre specific or tone specific elements and leaving irrelevant elements blank. Like maybe don't touch them or downplay them. In a world you're building for like a gritty game about superheroes, this will require some detail on like maybe how the criminal justice system works how the superheroes are regulated. And since this is gritty, it'll push you towards specific answers. Like, oh, well, the criminal justice system, it's fucked. <laughs> and superheroics are, you know, punished legally, you know, whatever. It'll, it'll push you towards that more of a gritty feeling. But if you're working on making your setting cozy, if you're looking for like a cozy kind of comforting game about superheroes, this is going to require other things entirely. You're probably going to think about like, okay, like local civics, like... How do the schools here work? Because you might, maybe this is like something on a smaller, more innocent level, or uh, thinking about how like neighborhood organizations might be impacted by your super heroics. If you like lead a neighborhood watch and it's just, you're just worrying about like who stole the neighbor's dog. Like it's, it's not as gritty anymore. It's not as dangerous and upsetting. So it will sort of influence not just what you're focusing on, but the answers that you give to these questions that you ask as you build your world. 
translate that back into mage, I'm thinking of a game where characters are orphans. That's a capital O term of art in the game. A character that is not part of an established faction in the Ascension mm-hmm. War. It's it's in an urban setting. And to me, the two big questions you have are how bad are mortal cities? Like how, how world of darkness do you want to go? And then right. what do the supernatural aspects of a city look like? Is it something where the technocracy is constantly on the prowl for, devi- for reality deviants that are using? using magic, in which case that kind of gives it an oppressive air. And it also tells your players, hey, any flashy use of magic is going to be punished. Or is it something where the technocrats are in deep space, constantly dealing with things, and you can go vulgar, assuming that you're willing to explain to a bunch of people why a gas main exploded or what have you. Or alternatively, uh, are characters in a power position relative to other supernatural factions? Are they just pawns to vampires because they're so thoroughly outnumbered and they constantly are kind of this, uh, I don't want to say oppressed minority, but a sought after group to have leverage over in just kind of that that supernatural politics. So the answer to those questions is going to kind of inform the feel that your game is going to have. Yes, exactly. If you're pushing for a really present, really well-connected technocracy, that's going to dictate what your what choices your player characters are making in the world in general, as opposed to like, oh, cool, I can just have fun with my magic. And as mm-hmm. long as I can like bullshit my way through it, it'll be fine. You, you might end up with like, I have to be extremely careful. Even the most minute use of my magic abilities will bring like a whole hellstorm down on me. So then it becomes like, is this use of your magic worth it? And you start talking about costs and consequences. And yeah, that's <laughs> that sounds cool as hell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the other side of that, to me, is mechanics. So you can say that consequences will be distributed by the gaming world. The other way you can do it, to me at least, is you can say consequences will be distributed by the system. Uh, In Mage, we have a paradox system. There's no magic points per se. There's no Vancian system where you need to memorize spells or anything like that. If you want to cast 15 effects in a row, you're more than welcome to, although at some point reality is just going to go, "Uh uh-uh, and you're going to accumulate paradox or be blown out of existence or paradox spirit is going to come after your ass or something like that. Do you have any guidelines on modifying mechanics to fit with the world and the tone that you've established? My work in uh, Exalted Crucible of Legends, a lot of my word count was developed was devoted to home rules for if you're trying to modify the setting or change your tone to fit the sort of game that you would like. If you're going for something that's supposed to be more of a, like the setting is a threat to your player characters, then you kind of want to play that up if you're talking about modifying your mechanics or introducing home rules specifically to support your tone changes or your setting changes. So uh, we're dealing with a storyteller system and it seems like the key knobs that we can change, at least from my point of view, are questions like one, how quickly do you allow characters to regain willpower in old world of darkness? You have, you you seemingly have the only two options are when you do something so life affirming that your sense of self is fundamentally reinforced. Like you look into your daughter's eyes for the first time or you graduate college or after a good night's sleep. (laughs) Yes. Um, Maybe we, and I I understand that willpower is still like, it's, it's the resource that makes you do your cool stuff. Mm -hmm. There are different spots in that spectrum that you can go for that are just like go to bed and, and, you know, drool on your pillow versus once in a lifetime events that happen to you. You can you can key it into, you know, specific actions that your player would undertake. And you can even use that as a way to encourage certain tropes, I guess, for your tone or your genre. Like if you're going for a very like hopeful kind of a game, you could say, well, players, anytime you inspire an NPC to take action towards like a positive goal, you I'll give you back a point of willpower. Like, it's, you know, really simple, like, little rule-breaking things like that. My other question would be, like, you mentioned Exalted, and one of the things I most like about Exalted is the existence of a stunt system, where, uh, based on how detailed an answer you give to the storyteller in terms of what your character is doing and how badass it seems, you get a mechanical bonus. As a designer, I, I know that um, some people are like, well, you're just rewarding people who can come up with flowery descriptions and everyone's turn takes 30 minutes. Do you think mm-hmm. stunting is a system that you can move to other games? And alternatively, are there variants of stunting that you think can modify the tone or mood of a game? Like if we want a, a broody urban fantasy game, is there a variant of stunting you can think of that would fit with that? I know that in, and I can talk about this because it's it's something that we've like divulged in playtests. Stunts are now a flat two die 
stunt bonus. Like in, in Exalted, normally it's a rating from one to three based on like basically how cool it is, which kind of puts people on the spot sometimes. Mm -hmm. It can be fun because you know, literally if all you do is describe it more than I hit him with my big sword, you get at least one dice or one die, well, one die stunt, all the way up into three die stunts, which are pretty nebulously defined. Like people will say, oh, it's something that really only happens once a session. It gets your whole table to go, wow. But some people, that can be hard to define, and they'll just th think, okay, well, as long as it's a really long description or uses a lot of flowery prose, like you said, that should be a three-dice stunt, right? And so to take the heat off of people, Exalted Essence Edition is just two dice, two dice stunt. Um, and you can spend those immediate, you can, you can basically bank these stunt dice and save them up like a bonus resource that lasts for the scene. You can spend those two dice on your action just immediately add uh just immediately add two dice or you can add one success or you can pass them to a friend and stunting is still basically did you describe your action cool here's two dice but, but... <laughs> hoarding that into other games i am a big fan of that idea personally because exalted works with such big numbers and it's assumed that your character is powerful like base level ex exalt is powerful not like oh just starting out you, you you can already like kill a small god if you want to so you may have to tweak what the reward for a stunt is depending on your game i mean two dice could be a huge deal to someone in a low level world of darkness game mm -hmm. um, i think when i was first starting to play exalted the joke was like in a world of darkness game you roll for anything that like makes you break out in a sweat anything that's more <laughs> complicated than crossing the street you have to roll but in exalted it's just assumed that like yeah, you pick up your big gold sword and you cleave the demon in two. Like, okay, cool. That demon was an extra, so it just dies. Like, so, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's, it's... A, there's a difference in, in power scale. I think bringing stunts into other games, um, specifically in storyteller system, I mean, it's almost a one for one. It's the dice pool with target number. It's it's pretty simple. Like, oh, cool. You, you described this action. Here's two dice. Here's an extra success or I'll give you back a point of willpower or whatever reward you feel is appropriate. The specific stunting actions, like if you could say, again, if you're starting like a low level World of Darkness, maybe a stunt only gives you one die, like an extra die to your pool because you don't want people to get like real wild with it. Maybe if it's a stunt that really upholds the themes you're trying to build in your game, you give them something a little extra. Like if they just describe their action in a cool way, here you go, here's your bonus. If they specifically describe an action in a game about resisting the technocracy's whole like brutal authoritarianism by like exerting their individuality through this magic that they're working, give them an extra bonus on top of that. Like you get double the stunt bonus because mm -hmm. you're like upholding exactly what I wanted to encourage in this game and in this world that I've built. So you have stunting, which which improves, which rewards the character mechanically for doing something that they consider to be in theme. One of the other things as a storyteller I find somewhat difficult is to, to encourage players to have their characters do things that fit genre, but may make things worse. For instance, uh, Fiasco as a game tries to create a game where people are constantly making absolutely terrible decisions. But that's Fiasco. It's intended to play over a single session. Characters are supposed to die. That's fine. Old World of Darkness has this broody horror theme to it where people often make bad emotional decisions and it complicates plots. But no one wants their character to die in most cases. Do you have any recommendations mechanically on how to reward play where a player does something that maybe is against their character's best interests, but fits in well with the world and maybe something the character would actually do, though? Oh, yeah. Immediately, the first thing I thought of was the fate system, fate core and fate accelerated, where uh, every character has, when you build your character, you have to determine what their quote trouble is, which is like their flaw. It's the thing that always gets them in trouble, basically. Mm -hmm. And the reward for having this trouble and actually letting it get you into trouble is you earn resources that way. You earn what are called fate points, which are kind of like fate's willpower points, really. They let you do your cool stuff. My first thought jumped to like, oh, just use troubles, like in Fate, like make sure every character has a specific thing on their character sheet that's like, this is what gets me into trouble. And if they let something bad happen to them, you give them back a point of willpower or you recharge this other thing or whatever. 
I like the, the the one that you had ventured so far, the idea of giving willpower whenever a character does something particularly in line with their character. Like uh, the way it's laid out in Old World of Darkness is willpower is generally recovered only when you do something great or heroic that particularly leans into it. Mage is interesting among the Old World of Darkness systems because for each nature and demeanor, it indicates both a strength and a weakness. So for instance, if I choose right. the character nature of pedant, I am both instructive but generally boring but historically the 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 game only rewards me when someone i instructed on how to do something succeeds but what what you're saying is you should also get willpower back when you bore someone to death yeah <laughs> uh, yeah anything that lays into it <laughs> i mean and, and yeah. likewise absolutely reward them not just for playing to the benefit of their nature or their demeanor but also playing to the flaw that's built into that if you're being like just an utter pedantic bore and it's actually getting you in trouble not not something like oh it's just something we're doing in role playing and it didn't really have any consequences on what was going on in the game it's like yeah okay that was fun just to role play it out but if you specifically say wait a minute i have this nature here what if i couldn't control myself and actually like talked down to this authority that we've been trying to sweet talk like can i get a bonus for for basically agreeing that my character undermines this like you should be rewarding them for being willing to like kind of throw the consequences into this as long as and this is a problem i've run into and in older games i don't play with people like this as much anymore but if if someone is doing something that just isn't fun for the game or the table if they're oh this is what my character would do but everyone is actually not on board with it i wouldn't reward that at all in fact i would probably encourage that player to rethink the yeah. action that they were suggesting on top of that in uh, Forged in the Dark games, like in Blades in the Dark and Scum and Villainy, you can do what's called a Devil's Bargain, which the Game Master can offer to the player, If you, basically along the lines of, if you agree that such and, such and such bad or uncomfortable thing happens to your character, I will give you this bonus. So it's really uh, not as much on the player to say, well, I have this flaw. I should be able to do this and get a bonus for it. So much as it is on the on the storyteller to say, all right, yeah, you're not going to have any trouble bypassing the lock on this door, but I will let you have like this extra bonus in this next scene if you let me say that even when you bypass the lock, an alarm you didn't know was there starts mm -hmm. blaring. Like, you know, like something like, I'll give you this if you let me do that, the devil's bargain. Honestly, I've been using that in games that are not forged in the dark <laughs> i've been using that in fate and in D D, and i find that players really react positively to that because it's another it's kind of another like illusion of choice thing that i yeah. like to uh <laughs> i like to wave a carrot in front of them and in, in uh in exchange for making the game more interesting and that's one of those things where for instance in the star trek adventures game that is something that a character can buy momentum at the cost of complications that you mm -hmm. can say hey storyteller i want a bunch of willpower back i understand it's going to cost me in the long term or, or that other thing we were talking about earlier where your character gets into trouble in a way that you think your character would and you get a bunch of willpower back for it where so okay the level of complication in the story has increased but you've also gotten a resource to help deal with that that hopefully balances out and allows us to have a more personal world and we also have the mechanical arrow pointing at it the yes. other one that i haven't seen formalized i think the closest i've seen are old world of darkness does not like giving players tools it likes giving characters tools it, it is very rare in world of darkness where uh, a player gets to determine an element of the narrative so i'm always curious about systems that allow you to say okay player i'm going to introduce this complication for the character in exchange i'm going to give you this hall pass that at some later <laughs> point you can modify some aspect of the gaming world to make it easier for you and th that whole idea of the difference between player player abilities and character abilities and maybe a moment of silence for forge theory switching from actor stance to maybe writer or director stance is something that owo doesn't quite embrace that i wish there were a good way to bolt that on uh, are there any systems that come to mind to you that uh give players narrative control in small ways in exchange for for upholding mood or theme yes absolutely honestly Back to fate, you can spend fate points to just declare a fact. If you're going to like a, a tense meeting with a rival and you're supposed to be negotiating a certain thing, you can spend a fate point to say, I already like the day before came here and 
scoped the place out and found that all of the minimum wage workers are really supportive of us. <laughs> like, you know, like you can mm -hmm. you can basically just like spend a spend a fate point, declare a fact about the setting. In story path in games like Scion and Trinity Continuum, especially in Trinity Continuum, you can do uh, dramatic edits. You spend your dice to alter things about the setting around you, you, which can still be like declaring a fact, but you can, for varying cost, declare that there's another door at the end of the hall that's unlocked. So your character can like rush towards it. It's not like a mechanical benefit, but it's a narrative thing that you can take advantage of. And I know in Assassins, there are rules to kind of build on that even to the point where you can start doing like retroactive dramatic edits, which Blades in the Dark handles really well. You basically make narrative edits in the actual like real time of the game, by which I mean you flashback because Blades in the Dark is sort of a heist game. It assumes that your player characters will just immediately leap to the action. You go from like, all right, gang, let's do it. And then you fast forward to the first sign of trouble, like, oops, they have guard dogs. And now you have the chance here as a player to go, I'm going to spend stress, which is one of their resources. I'm going to spend stress to say that I knew these dogs would be here. And I made sure to bring these big fat eel steaks with me to distract them. So then, oh, okay. And the game master can say, yeah, all right, that'll give you this bonus to dealing with this. Or we'll say you can just bypass this challenge or something like that. I think maybe this might be like a newer conceit, like in the last decade or so of, of gaming. I can actually think of quite a few systems that kind of put the onus of narrative change or narrative tools, I guess, on the players and not just the GM. Yeah, it's just one of those weird things that seems to only slowly change over time. And if we are going to modify our system to make willpower something that fluctuates more, there, there's nothing preventing a storyteller from saying for two points of willpower, you can make a small narrative change, or for four points of willpower, you can make a large narrative change and, and still pretty mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. keep everything in-house. And especially if that narrative change leans into that mood or theme that you're trying to do, if you're trying to set up a, a double cross because you're trying to create a tense world, or if you're trying to kindle a moment of hope or something like that, it also allows players to introduce NPCs, which tend to have a life of their own in a way that I think a lot of storytellers are afraid of. I, I, it almost feels <laughs> like it came, came out of this like adversarial view uh, of gaming that yeah. persisted for seemingly 30 years. So. When you think world building, are there any games or settings or authors that you're like, oh man, this person is super good at this? Or alternatively, are there any settings that when you think about them and the world building aspect, you're like, this just doesn't make sense? I know fiction wise, but uh, uh, JKR famously can't keep her fucking mouth shut. I don't know if you remember the whole wizards would just poop their robes thing <laughs> from last year. <laughs> No, are you I, in on that? I, oh, I am. Boy. I am not familiar with the world of Harry Potter and the contrived plot device. Well, it was uh, last year. It was like the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, which is some like fandom website had tweeted out that oh, I'll just find the exact Twitter because it's hilarious. Nice. The tweet is. And this is from January 4th, 2019. Hogwarts didn't always have bathrooms. Before adopting muggle plumbing methods in the 18th century, witches and wizards would simply relieve themselves wherever they stood and vanish the evidence. Hashtag National Trivia Day. <laughs> that, like, porting that into it's, the world of mage, that's the weirdest reason to generate year. paradox. <laughs> it's been a year, and it still does, like, 2d10 psychic damage to me every time I see that. That is an example of world building where, like, it's not just bad. <laughs> Nobody is going to engage in that. This is not relevant to anything. We want to forget it. And also to shit on another fiction author, Stephanie Meyer, really, okay. really bad at world building. <laughs> of the uh, the Twilight series, what, what do you consider yes. to be the failure there? Well... What's interesting with where her world building started to fall apart and a lot of like actual like Twilight fans were really upset at things that she developed in the fourth and final book of the set of the series where she tried to kind of bring a scientific justification to her vampires, which her mm -hmm. vampires were already pretty weird. Like they're venomous, they're really cold and like marble hard. It, her vampires are already kind of like a step away from the norm of you know folklore but then she tried to come into it with like oh the vampirism process crystallizes your cells 
and vampires have extra chromosomes. We didn't need that information. We were fine suspending our disbelief to be like, okay, cool, your vampires are venomous and cold, whatever. But because she tried to bring it more into the real world, it only highlighted how fucking ridiculous it was. <laughs> so it just, it was no good. <laughs> Anti-world building, when details added by yes. an author make the setting make less sense. Yes, when we were perfectly fine with just accepting that's how the vampires were but then she tried to make it real in a sense by attaching these scientific justifications to it that were even more ridiculous than the idea of a vampire that glitters hmm. now the vampires supposedly have crystalline cells and extra chromosomes and it didn't make any sense at all and it, even the fans were like this is ridiculous and bad <laughs> interesting uh, are, are there any that you think particularly nail it for really good examples of world building. I, again, I'm bringing it back to Sandy Pug. We had, a, by the way, I mean, Monica and I on Bonus Experience had Liam Ginty on about a year ago when their game Americana was on Kickstarter. And Americana is set in a 1950s fantasy world with no institutional isms. So it's like, um, you know, the greaser era of, you know, American culture but you can play orcs you can play goblins you can play elves and skeletons and liam was adamant that's like this is there's no institutional racism no institutional homophobia like individuals might be homophobic if you if characters want or players want to engage with that but overall we we kind of wanted this we wanted this to be like an escape setting where you could go and just have fun and not worry about you know some of the shit that's like dragging you down it's it's a really cool world that they built but the point where i went like oh fuck that's amazing <laughs> was um when they they pointed and it's such a little detail it's where they pointed out that since like sentient skeletons like free willed undead are one of the fantasy peoples that you can play as and these skeletons can't actually speak they don't have tongues sign language is a really big part of the world and just about everyone learns sign language and i i just remember this being like like such a cool like i flipped out over it that's so amazing and it's just a little detail that i wouldn't have thought of that enriched that setting that really drove home this inclusivity of you know well we can't leave out this whole like section of people everybody's got to learn sign language so we can all communicate and it was just a really cool little detail that really emphasized that this is this is going to be fun this i mean this is still going to be a like a game about some con you know some interesting concepts like you know your dead friend and and it's you know how can we solve this murder but you don't have to worry about like being left out which i i just really liked and i still think about that a lot what is it yes. built on top of I um I think it's a a system that they have come up with on their own. I know that I was more interested in the 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 narrative and story potential at the time because uh Liam was talking about how most of the games are set around the concept of your dead friend because as you as your players make characters, the players also create the dead friend that everyone is connected to in some way. Um so you have like this phantom character that you build your backstories on that you build your characters around and then the the game can optionally be about trying to solve the mystery of what happened to your friend but i think there's also because they their kickstarter went above and beyond i think they also have a uh super sentai themed yes a version of it yes <laughs> it's very good americana is yes i Magic need Force to go. Uh, i need to get people involved in playing it with me yeah <laughs> I think Microscope is currently at the top, followed by Star Trek Adventures. Yeah, I want to play Microscope so bad. Uh, so I've had two games of Microscope just completely fizzle because I can't get people involved. If you have any interest <laughs> in doing in playing with like a weird internet stranger, I would love to. Um, yes, absolutely. Okay, I'm on your podcast talking about world building, and you're asking me if I want to play <laughs> I don't Microscope want to with you. A busy lady with important <laughs> things to do. Um, <laughs> But uh, one of the things I wanted to do was come up with a alternative setting of Mage that basically said, hey, the modern history of Mage happens starting with this event, the fall of Mistridge. The Craft Masons and the, the Order of Reason attack this particular Hermetic Chantry. What if that didn't happen? And just kind of redo those 600 years of history.
history. That was just an example of what I wanted to do. But I always like the idea when you're like, okay, for today's game, we're going to play a completely different game because it fits it better. Or, or I am also fine doing just about anything else because I enjoy the intersection of improvisation, index cards, and games. Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if you if you have something that you would like to uh, to microscope, we can we can figure something. Just invite out. me. Just I don't just invite me. I don't oh, care okay. what kind of microscope game it is. <laughs> just be like, hey, do you want to play? It's at this time. I'll be like, yeah. <laughs> okay. I will try and make that work. Okay. Thank uh, you. Thought, thoughts are happening, listeners. Hopefully, this happens. <laughs> I probably should have come up with a better way to do it uh, to, to phrase that. But <laughs> so the other thing is, it seems like world building is an extended process of determining the ramifications to changes in the world. Like one of the ones I often see are like these absolutely wild alternative histories. Where it's like, what if, what if we didn't invent the atomic bomb during World War II and it was still being fought, and we had seventh generation Nazis who were fight- and you're just like, wait, how did you, how did we get here? Do you have any yeah. recommendations on how to figure out how those changes will propagate through a world? Well, I think again back to when we were talking about making changes to the setting of Mage. I think a lot of it is your big question, like, oh, you know, what if we didn't invent? the atomic bomb and we're still fighting World War II. I feel like there's already an answer there that you want to revolve the setting around. Like you're asking the question, but Mm, you already have in your mind, like, oh, it would probably look like this. So answer the question for yourself. And then from there, again, consider the kinds of stories and characters you would like this to encourage in your players. And then it's the falling dominoes of, okay, so then what are the biggest events or factors of the setting or this history and how would they have changed? If you are doing something as dense as literal world history, you may have to filter that out into, okay, what are the biggest events and factors of military history specifically that would have changed? I don't know that fashion history would have changed. It probably would have, it may not be relevant to you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, then you just kind of spiral out into, okay, if we're still fighting World War II, does Microsoft still get started? Do we do we still have Windows machines? <laughs> like kind mm-hmm. of weird, you know, and then, you know, focus on the stuff that's relevant to the kind of stories and characters you want to encourage. Do your research. Again, remember to, to look into like, are there already examples of this happening now that I can just borrow from or, you know, things like that. But also remember to remember to leave room for the people who are also way into the settings lore or history to kind of make their own splash in this alternate setting. Like you can come up with like a really intricate alternate history for we're still fighting World War II, but make sure that if you have another like military history buff joining your game that you haven't answered all the questions already that they can get involved too and say, well, here's my character who answered these questions. And this is the the storyline that I want to follow with this character that I've made. If, if that makes sense. Leaving blank spaces is always a good practice for game design because that's where the player can like slot themselves in. But especially when it comes to things where you're like modifying established lore or, you know, actual history. Because there's going to be someone who's like really passionate about that and wants to have their own say in it. I was playing a game of City of Mists. And at one point where we we decided that the game was going to take place sometime in the 90s, just with less homophobia. And um, and slightly different fashion aesthetics. And one of the characters is like, I can't give you the information because of uh, HIPAA regulations. And I'm like, we established that this game took place after the release of Counting Crows, August and everything after, but before <laughs> the release of The Miseducation of Lauren Hill. <laughs> HIPAA wasn't it wasn't enforced until 2003 and he's like damn it no <laughs> like, holy shit <laughs> you got played fool um, but I mean <laughs> I mean it required he, trivially he just said page and confidentiality I was just super proud that for like one shining moment I got to be the history dork at a table um, and that but, you specifically framed it in <laughs> the releases of these two albums <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and some gentlemen, I'm single. I'm not <laughs> single, but um, the uh, the other rule that came to mind was uh, sometimes I, I am a big Star Trek dork, and one of the things that Star Trek regularly does is when they talk about something, they will always have a list of three, of which two people you will have heard of, and one you will have never done to like indicate that it's clear in the future like ah he's a medical genius on on par with galen 
or Sulk or or Santig or something like that. And the last one was like, who the hell's that? Oh, it's some Vulcan guy or something like that. Yeah. And they always like, that is one of the narrative techniques to kind of show that it's a world that still functions by the rules you know, but something has changed, that you have some departure there. The other one was in the creation of Back to the Future. The set designer said everything should be 85% recognizable. Yes, yes. And only by changing 15%, the world actually looks more different because you're constantly encountering, oh, that's a little bit different, as opposed to a completely alien setting, which actually looks less weird to a lot of people. Uh, it was something yes. they had learned when they yeah. were doing set design. Um, that, and that's something, too, that I like. I was, I was thinking about touching on it, but I wasn't sure if it would be. But I'm so glad you brought it up that having the familiar juxtaposed with something completely unfamiliar is such a great way to throw someone off their balance and, and remind them, this is a weird place that you're in right now. This is, you should, you should not be making assumptions. If it's completely weird, like just completely off the cuff, everything is different. All our elves are different. All our magic is different. <laughs> like <laughs> then people feel like, Oh, okay, cool. Nothing, you know, every, everything is loosey goosey. You know, everything is, what was it? Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. Like, you know, but if you have like, just enough of it is different that it feels weird then people aren't really sure what still applies and what's changed and it can be a really interesting dynamic i want to do an art book that is just the statue of liberty slightly modified for different settings like you have the man in the high castle where it's doing the sig heil salute i want to like there's the variant where it's the uh the statue of liberty just like holding a big ass sword and like i think the hat the statue of liberty holding strange objects to me has been like the greatest tropes in in terms of this is the world you're in now deal with it fuckers um, yeah that I yeah think look at what's important it. here instead yeah. of this now it's that yeah <laughs> things yeah. are different somewhat think about it yeah. okay and i guess my final question is uh so we've we've revved up our audience with a whole bunch of things you can go and change the world what do you think the common pitfalls are when people go about world building or changing it if they wish to to slightly uh, misquote you thank you so what are what are your recommendations to people who want to go out and literally change the world yeah, my, my recommendations are try to find when to stop. One of one of the pitfalls, and I touched on it with like when I was talking shit about Stephanie Meyer and JKR, <laughs> is sometimes world builders do too much. They're detailing systems or events or elements that players are not going to engage with. Pe players aren't going to want to engage with. A lot of times, uh, doing too much involves, especially in in fantasy, when we're doing our when we're putting our heart and soul into a fantasy heartbreaker, you'll see detailed multiple writing systems and maybe a few conlangs for one particular culture out of like the other five that your players might interact with. Like this, it's so minute and niche and takes up so much time and energy and is all wasted because <laughs> nobody's going to learn this conlang that you're coming up with. And I say that as someone who's like an amateur sociolinguist, I love language. Conlangs are a total waste of time. <laughs> Well, the so fact sorry. that you use the term conlang, I feel like kind of. <laughs> yeah. Always make sure to do your research. Um, where relevant, look up real world examples of dynamics that you want to create within your world, both for accuracy and to avoid doing something really fucking insensitive. If you're thinking about, oh, uh, what about what about this society or this people now has uh, now they practice long collections of, of rituals when anyone dies, then read up on actual like real world mortuary which rituals um if you're thinking about what if we run into some uh, early early technology tribe where the people practice cannibalism don't do that <laughs> just don't do that <laughs> yeah. ray says no to cannibalism please don't <laughs> spicy takes just oh it's done and it's racist and it's done the other thing to watch out for is to don't answer all the questions that your setting poses but don't also make everything so fucked up that there's just no hope of fixing anything don't go with everything's fine or everything's hopeless um even if you have a lighthearted tone you need to create points of conflict you need to have these spaces where the players need to step in and solve something even if you have a crap sack gritty world you need a few challenges that are actually surmountable. You need things that can actually be overcome or your players will feel as though they don't have any agency. But other than that, <laughs> like <laughs> other than a couple of like meta, like learn when to stop 
make sure you're doing your research and make sure you have that fine line between hard to solve and not impossible. I don't know that there's really a wrong way to go about world building. Just have fun with it. I think the only addition I have to that is realize what settings are thought experiments and what are actually good canvases for an interesting chronicle. Like, yes. I, I encounter a lot of people like, it's imagine a world where blah, 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 blah. I'm like, oh, yeah, I would like to imagine a world where the Nefandi have completely won the Ascension War and everyone is suffering under their brutal hero and their only dark glimmers of hope. I am perfectly fine thinking about that while I'm like, eating a veggie burger or something like that. Do I want to play that game? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I feel like there's like kind of a step zero before one goes apeshit on world building with their table that says, hey folks, are you interested in this? Does that actually sound cool? Or is this just a funny idea I had because I was like hitting the weed too right. hard? Yeah, um, the, the interest check is yes. probably a good <laughs> step zero. <laughs> but I created two new alphabets already and technically the second is just an objod because it has no vowels. Just don't yeah. do that. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Take it easy. Yeah. Take it easy on the languages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Design one fewer language than you think you need to for your game. Yes. That's... It's like the whole, like, you're leaving the house, take off two accessories. <laughs> like... <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> And with that, uh, Ray, thank you so much for your time. If we're interested in tracking your work or your thoughts on things or any of your projects, where can we do that? Well, uh, I'm on Twitter. My username is Ray W. Cole. I do a lot of mindless chatter there. Normally I have a website. I don't right now. Maybe by the time this comes out, I will have a website. <laughs> when I do have a website, the the uh, URL is raywcole.com. And um, I really think that's the only way to get in contact with me. Please do not. And uh, you've made mention to Bonus Experience uh, a couple times. Oh, what yes. What is that and where can we listen to it? Bonus Experience is a podcast with a deeper look at the play experience and the finer details of running and writing games ran by uh, two queer women with authority in gaming. Uh, and you can find that at bxpcast.com or go to misdirectedmark.com, which is the uh, network that we're a part of. And we have uh, quite a few episodes now. I don't know how many. I'm guessing we're approaching a hundred. Oh, we might almost have a hundred episodes. Really? I gotta, I gotta count. And talk to Monica. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but yeah, that's what I'm doing. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been awesome. You've been listening to Mage the podcast. You can subscribe to our show on Spotify, Anchor, TuneIn, iTunes, Google Play Podcasts, or the podcaster of your choice. If you like us please give us a review on a platform of your choosing or just shoot it out to the world over like Twitter or something. We have a hopping Discord community at discord.me slash podcast, and you can also give us your thoughts and feedback over email at madesthepodcast at gmail.com or on Twitter at madesthepodcast. If you'd like to support us and get a cool chat color in Discord, go to madesthepodcast.com and click on become a supporter of Mage the Podcast. This episode is made possible from the support of executive producers, but first, I previously promised to read everyone's name over some fat beats, and Charles Siegel alerted me to a humble bundle sound package, so executive producers, please enjoy your names being read over the original track I composed yesterday, entitled, Thank You Executive Producers, I Made This Specifically For You, and It's Totally Legal, Part 1. Anders, Andrew, Brendan, Bryce Perry, Chris P., Chris Zach. Ira Grace, Justin, John Magnuson, Michael Parker, Richard Batbrewster, and William. Thanks, folks. Also go to magesthepodcast.com for show notes and all of our previous shows. Now go change reality. 